feel free to stop any time and ask questions if you feel that something has to be explained better yeah yeah sure in detail yeah <clears throat> I think we are live. All right. So a very good afternoon for everyone. Thank you for making time and attending this uh, session. We have Sarvesh Chinagi, um, a product designer and also a CTO of a very unique company called Aero Hans. Uh, we all call it in a, with a nickname of Odinem or a taxi. It's very apt uh, being an indigenous Indian vehicle. All right. So I uh, have uh, Dion with me, the uh, marketing head of uh, Design Quotient Labs. So uh, the session will be moderated by Dion and myself. And uh, welcome, Sarvesh, for this session. And uh, we are really looking forward to see your work. Thank and, you. Uh, I hope the all the uh, audiences are able to see the live stream. And if yes, can you just type in S so that we know that uh, you are able to follow what we are uh, what we are uh, showing here? Can you all see the screen share? If yes, can you say yes, please? Not getting any responses. Oh, yes. Perfect. All right. So, yes, Sarvesh, uh, please take over and uh, take us through your journey and what you're working on. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Umesh. Thanks, Dion. Uh, first of all, thank you for calling me here to talk about what I've done and what kind of work I'm doing, which is going to help uh, all the audience here in deciding their careers or in whatever they're working on. Probably they could take away something from what we're doing. Uh, my talk is going to be all about my journey into the field of design and mostly focusing on the current project that is what you're excited about, which is the Air Taxi of the Aerohens project. So uh, I would probably want to start with uh, why I became so just to uh, create an overall story. I start from how I became a designer and from a designer how to a job and how I started on my own and build myself to design this air taxi. Uh, to start with, probably I will just show you a video of the air taxi so that uh, you get excited about what you're going to see next probably. Uh, let me know if you're going to, if you're seeing the video. Can you see the video? Yes, sir, if you can see the video, please go ahead. Okay, okay.
All right. So what you just saw was the dream that we all are looking at. I hope you could see the video clearly. Yes, Sarvesh, that's quite exciting. Daddy. Umesh, I'm not able to hear. Yeah, it seems we have lost the Sarvesh. All right. Solution. All right. So let us just wait uh, Good. For a couple of minutes. Yeah. Could you please uh, put your screen, the home screen? So what I suggest is, uh, Dion, can you please make your presentation? As sure. You Sarvesh, oh, to Umesh, I'm not able to hear. Yeah, it seems we have lost Sarvesh. All right. Right. Are you able to see my screen? Um, Umesh, could you please confirm if my screen can be seen? Yeah, we can see it. Yep. All right. All right. I think we lost uh, Sarvesh somewhere in between. So what I'll do is till Sarvesh comes back. Um, oh, Sarvesh is back. All right. Yeah. Let me just uh, finish. Uh, spend two minutes telling everyone here a little bit about DQ Labs. So uh, at DQ Labs, what we do is we transform art into a career, something like what Sarvesh has done. All right. Uh, what we do is uh, all students are creative and what they do is they keep sketching all over the place. Now, what we do is we channel this creativity into something functional. So if you see here what Siddharth has done, Siddharth has made a logo and kept, kept sketching out a logo and we have helped guide Siddharth into making something uh, what he thinks would be a logo for a coffee shop. And then when you actually see the output, the output is brilliant, you know, and it's something that could actually be used. So this is what really design is, you know, channelizing your creativity into a specific output where um, this output is used. And, and, and really there are tremendous amounts of careers available spreading across uh, architecture, spreading across design and fashion. And, and that's what we want all of you to do, to grab onto opportunities that you get just like Sarvesh has, all right? Uh, a little bit about the founders of DQ Labs. We've been founded by Umesh and Sean. They're both designers from IIT Delhi and batchmates with Sarvesh. Uh, Umesh is an architect and a designer, a TEDx speaker, and, uh, uh, and has worked with Jaguar Land Rover and Hyundai Motors. And Sean has been with General Motors as well before founding DQ Labs and Exampli. Both of them have founded that together. Uh, Exampli, for those who don't know, is a learning platform, a learning assessment platform, and uh, and uh, it's the it's the world's first learning acceleration platform, and uh, this was significantly recognized and rewarded by NASCOM, uh, and we won the Design for India 2019 award by NASCOM. Uh, the founders of DQ Labs are into education research, or in the field of learning design. So what that means is something that needs to be learned. How do you ensure that process happens well? 
all right so their research was was uh, presented at a, at the singapore learning design and technology conference uh, a very prestigious place to be um, apart from uh, from this, we have a free sketching session. If Rohit could share the link on the group so that all participants could participate in this free three-day session to learn sketching, all right? Uh, we also have the industry e-meets like, uh, like what we're doing with, with Sarvesh, and this is open to absolutely anyone. And we have school meets as well, where we invite prominent designers who head or academicians who head uh, various design schools. Uh, but apart from those free sessions, we do offer services as well. If you are in the age of 12 to 20, or if you know someone who's creative, then the design exploration program would be a brilliant program for them to join just to explore their creativity. We have skill development programs open to anyone. We have entrance exam coaching, NATA, NID, NIFT, UCED, SEED, JEE paper two, and we also do portfolio guidance where we help people uh, bring out their best through a portfolio. Um, a unique aspect of DQ Labs is that we have been consistently encouraging students to participate in live projects. We have had students building live projects for a few startups. We've had uh, uh, students getting paid internships, so like Palak Sheth and Amrita Arora, paid internships with Texas based the Learn Cloud. We've had our students working with Designathon, where they work with real designers um, and real architects to solve problems for NGOs. And you see here, there's some brilliant output done by some of our students. Um, our students who've cracked design entrance exams, the latest, most updated uh, results are here. First rank in four disciplines for our PG students. Um, NID UG, we have almost 60 students who've cleared. UCED, uh, JEE paper two, we've got a 99.92 percentile. We have over 100 students who've cracked NIFT round one. We would like it if all of y'all follow us on DQ Labs. Uh, we're available on Instagram. We're available on Facebook. Um, you can just search for Google at any of our locations across India and um, and you can, you can uh, we can be out there as well. So uh, this is where we're located. Feel free to contact any one of our counselors and they'll be most happy to get back in touch with you all right all the best thank you so much over to sarvesh thank you dear thanks a lot sarvesh yeah uh coming back to the story uh i would start with saying that uh doing the air taxi or a futuristic project of that scale and that complexity is not, uh, it didn't happen overnight. And it took years of learnings from, from me as well, right from my childhood. And those learnings have built my, my skill sets and my experiences uh, by which I could do this kind of project. And people would want me to do that project. So just to start with uh, how it began was from when I was a kid, my father used to have this particular workshop, fabrication, metal fabrication workshop. And he used to make these decorative uh, articles in his workshop, like all his designer swings and uh, pot stands and all those things. And I used to always, the workshop was just next to my home. And I used to see him do his work, see with details, the observations that I did. And I was very curious how things are made. And from there, I started working with those people, the, the engineers who worked on there. And I, I said, okay, let me also make these things. So when I was small, I used to make these things by copying what my dad did. But with my own hands, I used to bend these things. I would uh, paint these, but the welding thing was done by the laborer. And I, I used to make these kind of small swings. Uh, but I think that's where the spark ignited, where uh, doing things hands-on started in my life. Uh, from my dad's workshop and an eye to detailing and observing exactly what is being done and just doing it. And as I grew up in school, uh, I started making paper crafts for different exhibitions. 
I was always interested in old automobiles and vintage cars. So I used to make matchbox models of those cars and bikes, and then some bridges that I made in school time. Uh, whatever resources are available, we used to use those and make things. Uh, in college, I used to stay in a hostel in Pune for doing my engineering. And there were in hostels. Everybody knows that there are a lot of small issues, and we are restricted to do so many things. And there were small problems. Like I was very lazy, and when I enter the room, there were three three of us staying in the same room. and uh, there was a switchboard just next to the door and if somebody wants to open the door or close the door i i didn't feel like i should get up and open the door so what i did is i, I made some uh, remote switches uh, purely mechanically uh, by using some linkages some ropes and wires so if anybody rings on the door i could just pull a string and open the latch and whenever somebody leaves i could pull a string and close the door also latch the door also when i And when i wanted to sleep i could pull some other strings and put off the light so those kind of things i always uh, kept doing when i was in hostel i think uh, so and also made it from hands on through different uh, things available readily available nearby uh after that i got into iit and uh why i got into iit is all because of these things that i done during my childhood that time dq labs was not there to help me out and create my portfolio or guide me in things but i was uh I had already done a lot of lot of things, and I could take these prototypes that I made for the latch thing, door latch, and the switches, and that was what my portfolio was, and that helped me to get enter, entered into the IIT because of my problem solving ability and thinking, uh, uh, design thinking approach that I had that time. I don't have anything documented because that uh, in 2002 the technology was not so advanced. Uh, in IIT also a lot of projects that was done. which also linked to my uh, hobby of doing vintage uh, was there was a car called Austin 7 you can see shown in one of the pictures there uh, it was a 1929 vehicle and uh, in the vacations after our first year uh, there was a professor somitri who asked us okay let's do this project and I, me and somitri found this vehicle in some jungle in the iit campus and then we decided okay let's make this uh, back to what it was in in those days so our batch worked on this car and we divided the work into different modules the engine chassis body work frame dashboard and what not and this was a near impossible task a near impossible uh project if you can see the car like a lot of things are missing and uh, we worked uh, during the vacations for two months as a group and uh, we almost uh, made it to a mint condition so this is the result that you see uh at the end of the vacation that the car was turned into so this was again a uh, a project where we could do the undoable uh and, and it works beautifully yeah it also worked beautifully i mean yeah. it's just not a restoration aesthetic restoration but also functionally we did a lot of work on that yeah we made the engine yeah. start umesh and shawn were part of the project as well yes so we drove the car to some uh, parts of uh, delhi to get the hood done the lights and what not i can remember each of these components and i feel still i still feel that we should uh, get back the car and make it running again okay so at iit again uh, we was a uh, what i learned was empathy like uh, stepping in the shoes of the users and understanding uh, their needs and working in solutions so myself being a violinist i also worked on one of the projects where uh, when i play violin since i was the user myself and there were a lot of issues like i want to play but i don't want others to get disturbed so we, i designed a violin wherein there's no sound coming out until you put a sound uh, pickup electric pickup and you can use headphones and you can play this violin without a sound box so these kind of projects were done where a lot of detailing and hands on work went on into making a very functional prototype and there are some few projects that we did for ticket vending and some stools for the blind people so you can fold it and uh use it for sitting anywhere if you don't have place to sit uh in trains for example and there was one more one more project that i did in iit my final year project was about i mean i had decided to work on air taxi and that's where i think uh, air taxi links to my profile right now i used to stand in queues to book my railway tickets to get back to my hometown from nizamuddin and there used to be a long queue and in those queue i thought okay why not make a project 
a car, a flying car, where I can fly back to my hometown. I started working on that project uh, in my second, in my final semester. I met those DDCA guys, the Subjalang Airport authorities. I met, went to meet it to look at the airport and the flying gliders. But my guide said, okay, this cannot be done in six months. So let's work on some other project. But yeah, this is where the, maybe the start of that project to be done came in my mind. Uh, I'll just skip, then I uh, went into working with Human Factors International, where a lot of travel happened. I worked on user experience project where user experience was important. Why I'm telling you all these things is that these are different layers of a person's uh, profile that you create. So you add, like you see those sedimentary rocks you might have learned in, in school. Through many years, a lot of layers get added, like how generations pass. And the overall profile that is created in the end creates the overall uh, structure of the stone and the beautiful stone that you see. That's how even in your life, each of these experiences count and they create layers around you from different aspects of life and that make you more uh, fruitful or more, what you can say, a rich uh, kind of a exposure to things which is very useful for design. So HFI helped me to uh, get a lot of insights. I, I traveled a lot in Asia Pacific, Europe to do some research on users in different fields. I worked with a company called Bosch and we designed a, uh, this device, which is for diagnostics of automobiles. Nowadays you uh, plug this into vehicles and you can see what are the errors in the vehicles. So this won an award in Germany for the best user center design award in 2007. Uh, later on, I'll just skip some of the projects because the interesting ones will come later probably. This is a startup called Design Incubator and Labs, which I did in 2006. And we worked on election systems for voting machines. So the voting machines that you see currently are very uh, specific to a particular booth. So we designed a very futuristic system where you can vote from any booth anywhere in the world. At the same time, you have all the security and safety data aspects of data and voting fulfilled in the same system. Uh, later on, I joined a company called Johnson Johnson and I worked for the Asia Pacific Innovation Center and we worked on medical devices for the Asia Pac region. Uh, we worked basically, basically on doing research, working with surgeons and doctors to find out what are the unmet needs that doctors have or the surgeons have in the surgery and coming up with solutions, making them, prototyping them, finding what to work, what doesn't work, and then creating a business model out of it. So these are things like uh, in the medical domain, uh, some of the products were patented. Uh, this is one of the products where uh, you see there's a patient with colon cancer, the large intestine cancer and you cannot uh, perform the daily uh, fecal uh, activity in the mornings. So you create a hole in a stomach and from there you have to, uh, they normally put a colostomy bag where all the feces come out. So it's a very uncomfortable uh, product which is available in the market. So we designed this plug wherein you can plug it into your colostomy hole and every morning you can just open the hole. There's a bellow that comes out and you can just pour it out into the uh, toilet. So this, is, this was a very con convenient and comfortable product which was patented by JNJ later on. Uh, the important thing is that uh, understanding the actual user needs and creating uh, solutions which can actually work. Another project was uh, again a patented project by JNJ. Uh, it is for total knee replacement. It's called TKR. You replace the knees with implants and there's a device which is used to hold and place the implant exactly in position where it has to go. So it's a very uh, technical design. At the same time, uh, the issue was that the products that are available right now in the industry for placing these kind of components in the knee are very clumsy and heavy. Around five to six kg is the weight of one device. And for a small patient, the hole that you make in your knee has to be large. The wound that created is large and it creates a very a delayed uh, healing period. So this is a very small device and it can change as per the size of the knee. So if for a large patient, the device becomes large. Once you rotate the knob, the device can become large and the device becomes shorter for a shorter patient. That is the USP of this product uh, that was made at JNJ. I was very bored by doing, uh, I was in JNJ for seven to eight, year, eight years. And since being a very uh, multi multidisciplined person, I, I like to work on multiple things. 
uh, i was bored by doing only healthcare innovations and i had a full book of ideas which i used to always keep writing and scribbling and i said okay then let's do something else uh, i then left jnj and then i said okay what do i do next so i said okay let me first figure out what i know i said i know design i know engineering i have some experience in the field of design engineering i have a lot of ideas in my notebook i have a so i said okay let's start on my own i, I didn't look for another job then in any other field i had some small funds so i also had a lot of good friends who could help me out with some projects if required i had a small workshop that my dad had with my machine so i just made a an account of what all i have what are the strengths i have and based on that i said okay let's start the consulting firm and i said okay not just design is the name uh, because i just don't do design i do a lot of things apart from design and design being at the core it also means not just design means design but everything something more than design as also so i started my consulting in 2006 and uh, i'll just skip up a lot of things in my consulting work that i did and i work on various projects including design research prototyping manufacturing because my dad had a workshop i started slowly moving on the mobility domain where i i am already interested in since i would we made some electric vehicles electric cars which are customizable so these were used by say food vendors or vegetable vendors it was a chassis customizable chassis which can be uh, articulated for a particular application so those kind of things we did and again i i said okay that's that's okay but again let's let's go back to my notebook and uh, consulting is not something that i would keep doing i would want to create something on my own so i, I went back to my notebook and uh, i started with the plan of okay what should i do uh, there are a lot of unmet needs every every designer starts designing for solutions and design we sol- we design solutions for some kind of needs that are there uh, with the users so i made a list of unmet needs that i feel that are long term needs like energy food traveling transportation health these are kind of needs that are always there and that would always be there uh, for long term so i said okay just not being entrepreneurs but i also work with responsibility towards the environment and society so i wanted to be a social entrepreneur eventually but uh, and i started listing out what are the projects that i could do and somewhere it clicked that okay let's start something in hybrid electric vehicle transportation or some transportation system and coincidentally i met some friends who were having similar ideas and we founded a company called uh, pdrl which is passenger drones which is limited this happened in just october 2018 so it is just more than a year old company and we had this dream of making uh, aerohans which is the air taxi for passengers it's a very futuristic project and uh, we said okay let's do this and anyway this is going to be there because if you see the problems of congestion in the major cities like bombay bangalore hyderabad pune uh, there are a lot of critical applications where say ambulances cannot pass or we have some critical urgent meetings and we could we cannot travel and it takes around 2 to 3 hours a day just to go from home to office so we are wasting a lot of time in traveling so how can we make it faster uh, and how can we add more time to our lives and we can add more value our, to our projects so that's where we started this project uh, i'll talk about this project in depth because that is what you would want to hear about so i'll just share some other screens on this project if you have any other questions about uh, this till now let me know i am okay for any questions in between everyone well. yes can you see the screen now yeah Yeah, not yet. Not yet. Okay. Yes, sir. We can see your screen. Okay. Uh, yeah. For, for all those who have missed. uh i'll again play the video for you if that is okay yeah yeah sure yeah
thank you okay so this is uh, what uh, this is just a rendering of the dream that we all had so we are six co-founders and we all put up this particular video as a starting point before even starting to do the air taxi thing uh, i hope you can see the screen now Let me just share it on the screen okay yep you can see the screen right yeah yes okay so we started with a alignment of okay this is a dream so uh, in design like we do normally we create a future scenario okay this is how we want to achieve so the video that you see that okay there is a future scenario when when somebody wants to reach office from place a to place b and how the thing is going to work how you can book some flight from your phone and how the flight comes to your drone port you can fly it to your destination and you come back yeah, to your destination so ultimately the need is going to be air traffic congestion living space so we started from that particular uh, concept rendering and uh, where we can get an alignment of okay this is what we are we are target going to achieve so we started uh, by saying okay it is a time now if we start development today this is going to come in future anyway so to reduce congestion to have healthy living lifestyle to improve productivity so these things are going to come we started with a design of designing a system of drones not exactly the air taxi but the overall system where these kind of flying vehicles would be commercially used in the society so we said okay let's uh, air air taxi is not going to come immediately because of regulations there will be something in between in between nothing and the air taxi which is going to be delivery drones or something where we can build confidence among users okay that something flying on drone technology is not going to fall down and it's going to be safe so probably air van aero van is what the product we call are going to be for cargo and carrying some other payloads so that is going to be an intermediate uh, project that we would be commercially doing before the air taxi at the same time air taxi uh, it will also be a one of the milestones to achieve the air taxi because air taxi will carry around uh, you see the specs of two models so one will be for two passengers and the other one is for four passengers this is just an initial rendering this is not the air taxi that might actually be there but uh, we started with the specifications and going reverse okay if this is going to be the product then how do you drill down to how to the basic pro, uh, specifications of the product so there are two passenger and four passenger air taxis uh the 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 delivery taxi that you see is something intermediate so it's it will carry around 100 100 kg payload so that will be that is going to be something in between the two passenger thing lot of technology as well as uh so when the approach over design approach is going to balance technology business as well as user experience we want to make the users very comfortable to use the taxi and that is where this product styling uh, also the functionality of the product how safe it is the kind of uh, vibe the vibes it gives out is important at the same time the technology required to fly a car is not simple it it requires advanced materials knowledge advanced propulsion system knowledge advanced energy systems like how can you pack maximum amount of energy in the smallest weight of a battery or any other power source those kind of things so a lot of cutting edge technology kal selection or we are not scientists but we would we could actually select technologies that can be applied to these kind of products so that kind of technology selection is also very critical to this kind of project at the same time business viability i can't have an a taxi where there is no business viability we just throw in money and not get anything out of it so probably like i cannot uh, pay say a lakh rupees for just flying 2 kilometers or 5 kilometers so how could we still bring in business viability in the whole project uh, is one of the other aspects so we worked on all three aspects to create a business model which could work uh, successfully on all, on all, all the aspects so it started with system design wherein we assume okay there is a product which is there already so wherein we assume there is a an taxi okay then how is it going to be operated in the whole system of use so there's a context there's a city there's a place there are buildings there are homes there is a government there will be lot of other taxis flying in the air 
so how would these work and how would this work seamlessly without accidents autonomously as well so how would these corridors be created uh, so we did a lot of brainstorming on that we, we created a lot of options we said okay these are the things we we also work with ddca which is the authority of the government who uh, manages and regular regular regulates these things so we also suggest to them okay these are the possible kind of ways in which these might operate because policy to come in place uh, so for them also they have to work on a lot of options and uh, they also don't know how it's going to work so industry uh, pushes those governments to create new policies and solutions so that's where we are working on uh, system level design as well to create some case studies and papers where government could use them so once the system is put in place uh, it gives us it gives us a lot of specifications to fit the production system then comes the product where we say okay for the air taxi to work we'll break it down into four phases which is prototyping phase alpha beta and the production phase typically prototyping is where we are right now we have almost finished the prototyping phase and the goal of the prototyping phase is basically to create a scaled down model a working model of the prototype the actual air taxi which is going to be around 400 kg of weight we created a 1/10th of the scale prototype which is around 40 kg uh and we want to make sure that we can uh we can have everything all the systems to put in place so it has to fly autonomously without the pilot it has to we have to make sure that all the propulsion systems work uh being an engineer and designer in between i look at both things so i manage technology as well as design so i have to look at ensuring that the, the thing flies as well as it works from the user aspects as well so uh we said okay let's make a small scale down prototype where we could test all the functions of the motors propellers the systems that we design have to be proven the technology the battery systems the calculations that we do mathematics that we work on are to be proven first and then only we can go for a full scale model or a full scale working prototype so we said okay let's make a full scale uh, scale down prototype 40 kg which will also be equivalent to a aero van which is a cargo drone so if we achieve a 40 kg payload uh, prototype we can also say okay, that is equal to a cargo drone and we can actually do business in cargo drones which can carry 40 kg payload so that's where we uh, was the first shot towards this uh, we had to balance two things as i said the technical design and the industrial design part and first what i'll do is i'll quickly walk you walk you through the technical design parts and how critical it was to also technically design the thing and we'll also look at the industrial design part that is of more interest to all of us here uh the technical design includes propulsion system how to design the propellers how to select the motors and batteries and how to ensure that the flight path the the duration that we want the drone to fly and the time that we wanted to fly it flies for that much amount of time so these are these are all given takes in between these three stages we designed a flight path how high it should fly how long it should go and based on that we did a lot of calculations uh it's a long flow chart we developed on our own how to achieve that kind of uh, propeller design uh then we selected a particular propeller we did a lot of engineering studies and tests to the to actually test these propellers the the actual thrust that they give if they can lift the drone or not i'll just skip again very fast through these we designed the motors actually uh why i'm telling you all these things is that there's a lot of dependency on technology uh we as designers when we work in such complex products a uh, lot of my my design team the id team also understands all these things very well because they work with the engineers to understand okay i have to design this duct uh where the propellers fit then i cannot just design a duct which looks good but the profile of the duct which also uh is important from aerodynamic point of view so uh, a lot of aerodynamic studies have been done and then a duct which also is good looking at the same time it it helps you improve the thrust or the lift of the drone so these are the kind of designs that we did and detailing of these designs like for example how the ducts would be manufactured and how it would fit onto the frame of the chassis in the most lightest lightweight form so these are kind of design aspects so my industrial designers have worked on these kind of things where uh, uh, not only the technical part but the duct where you look at the design for assembly the assembly aspects of the duct and how you can make it lightweight uh 
uh, this is the kind of chassis that we designed in the end and there'll be top covers and bottom covers so this is a scaled down prototype that we did i just uh, go ahead on the structural design then where we look at all the fitments of the parts so we did a lot of layouts uh, we created some mock up models on mount boards to look at how are the usability aspects can i actually use my hand to put the battery inside the frame or how are the component components being placed or do we have this kind of shieldings in between components then we created a accurate prototype which is pva prototype to actually fit the components in place and see whether uh, everything works and then we actually created the prototype in aluminum which is a functional prototype which is able to fly so this is the structure or the chassis of the drone that we are going to uh, fly it on uh, this is for functional testing and actual test testing uh, the aspects that you see here are probably the layouts how are the different components placed what are the different zones how can we separate the electrical zones from the signal zones so that the interference of signals and and the high electricity components can be worked on all these aspects are uh, done by the designers and uh, in collaboration with the engineers to ensure that the engineering aspects are as well fulfilled when you actually do the design of the whole uh, product so there is something a balance between technology and design that is happening here so operational requirements symmetry balance uh, then we did the actual manufacturing of the chassis and the prototype with actual components fit fitting in the chassis uh, this chassis is around 2 meters by 2 meters so it's a huge drone it is around 6 feet by 6 feet wide drone and then we actually did the testing of this uh, drones i'll just show a quick video of the test that we did on this drone then we'll move right to the design aspects after that so i'll just open some videos where we actually did some testing in house we started with some in house testing wherein uh, before going in the field uh, i'll just share something here so before going to the field we said okay let's test it in the in the lab so we tied some harness on the drones with some weights and we said okay let let's see if it flies we are very scared of this particular thing so yeah once we are confident that uh, it can fly this particular thing because we had done it for the first time then okay let's say we said okay let's go to out in the field and then uh, test fly it outside and then we again uh, tied a rope to it because we didn't want it to fly and this is flying autonomously so there is no pilot who is actually flying it so we said that okay let's tie a rope so that accidentally should not fly away and hurt hurt anybody else so the thing where we actually uh, i'll just share a video where we actually flew the drone uh, outside in the field i hope you can see the video now this is where it is flying in the field Imagine this is a very huge prototype. It is around six feet by six feet. So maybe in the video it looks very small, but it's a very scary thing, uh, even for us when we flew it for the first time. It's huge, like it's like a motorcycle size.
So the propellers are actually rotating at around six to seven thousand RPM. So it's a very high speed, and in the video you can see it very slow. So this is where uh, we said, okay, we are okay with the technology now. So all the technical aspects have been fulfilled, and we could actually fly the drone autonomously. Uh, and then we actually parallelly also worked on the industry design aspects of it, which I will share now. So this is where the after the ID and OD outdoor testing was done, we are confident that okay, we have the technology, and then we can start uh, looking at integrating the design or the enclosure or the body of the drone with the frame. So this frame now can be used for delivery drones, where you can attach a payload or a box where we can carry things from a place A to place B. For example, we can use it for uh, applications like healthcare. We can carry blood samples from a hospital to the pathology lab. Or we can carry organs from a organ transplant hospital to a donor or a receiving hospital who is going to transplant the organ to a patient in the shortest possible time. So those kind of applications can be done by these kind of frames, which can carry a carry a huge payload of 40 kgs. So you can actually refrigerate an organ and uh, and transport it in the shortest possible time without affecting the other traffic. I hope I am audible even now. Okay, coming back yes, to the design. audible, but uh, there's no there's no screen share happening. Okay, I'll just again share it. Probably just a second. Okay. Okay, you can see it now, I guess. Yeah, we can see it now. Okay, so after that we uh, said, okay, I mean, it was happening parallelly, but I'll explain or go th walk through, walk you through the design part. We started with uh, typical things like, uh, what are the kind of uh, keywords that, or the kind of impression that we want to give out of the taxi? It should be friendly because the first important aspect is safety and friendliness. So people should accept their taxi, and it should not create an alien feeling. Okay, whether I should sit it, sit into it or not, it should be uh, approachable. So it should be elite or pride because we want to do business and we want to tap into the <laughs> big market first. And since it's a future technology, it should also look modern and high tech. So the design team actually started working on different words and created a word board on what are the things that we want to portray through the design. Uh, we created image boards and mood boards where uh, these kind of uh, impressions or the kind of aspects of design are seen in the existing products. So we could pick up some uh, inspirations or abstracts from these kind of products that are available in the society or market. So these kind of mood boards and image boards is what we started with. So that uh, we also have an alignment internally and we also go to users and we look at what are the choices of users and what are the things that they particularly like, these kind of people. Uh, then uh, a lot of sketchings happened uh, so two of our designers and myself, we started sketching on uh, the enclosure, that the chassis that you saw earlier, the frame. How could we build an enclosure over it, which is which will be common for the air taxi and common for the uh, delivery drone. So, so if we attach a passenger module underneath, it could be an air taxi, or if you attach a uh, delivery module underneath, it, it could be a delivery drone. So it started with a lot of thumbnail sketchings and different aspects. Uh, Eventually, it went down to 3D models of the selected concepts, and we created a design for this, which we could showcase for the delivery drone. So, the, ch the flying chassis that you saw earlier, uh, this is the kind of uh, design that would go inside. If you see the inside, you see the same chassis here. Uh, another aspect of the design was the arms that you see. The air taxi design that we have is is a redundant design. So even if some propellers fail. So if a motor stops working, say, or the propellers fail, or even if a particular arm breaks and it falls down or it falls wherever, the drone can still fly on the three propellers or two propellers. So the design, the technology has been designed such that a lot of safety and redundancy has been built 
not only from a mechanical point of view, but also from the electronic point of view. There are a lot of sensors, gyroscopes, uh, IMUs, magnetometers inside the electronics. And there are multiple such sensors inside. So it takes a lot of readings from multiple sensors and creates a lot of uh, usable signals. I'm not going to detail into technologies, but what I'm trying to say is that there's a lot of redundancy built in each of the components of the, of the system so that a lot of safety is built inherently into the drones. So there are four batteries. You see the green ones. So even if one or two batteries fail, so there's a bus bar where all four batteries provide current. So even if batteries fail, uh, one or two batteries can still survive and or uh, make the drone fly and bring it safely down there on the ground. So these kind of safety things have been built. So going back to the design, we started with the packaging, how the things will be packed over the frame, where is going to be passenger fit sitting, where are the electronics going to fit, where are the batteries going to fit. So like allocation of different spaces. So we did a lot of brainstorming on that, which is the right place to maintain the balance, the usability of the, uh, the drone at the same time. Uh, so yeah, a lot of sketching happened. I'm just showing you some glimpses of it. And there are at least 1,000 times more sketches uh, that have been made throughout this time to come up with the actual design. Uh, we also started parallelly sketching the passenger module of the drone, how it should look like, without being restricting on this particular chassis. Uh, a lot of design directions happened. Uh, this is for a two-passenger taxi right now. So the, the chassis that you saw is a scaled down model for a two passenger taxi. These are kind of uh, 3D models. So this is, a, this is a kind of concept that we actually selected in the end. Uh, some minor changes were made on this later on, but yeah, this particular kind of design where it looks very much aerodynamic from a functional point of view. At the same time, it looks modern and high tech. Uh, we did some models on these 3D models to fit it to the chassis. We did some proportion study on these particular things, uh, how this will be actually stretched or things like that, how the passenger is going to fit the oral package. And there are a lot of renderings that we went through. Uh, this was for business purpose as well, because we, ha we had a lot of investors in the company. So a designer has to work, work on a lot of aspects. One is for the users, uh, there are a lot of stakeholders, I can say. And there are also investors whom we, we want to showcase the product to get excited about and what we're going to make. So we can we also kind of visit. We did a lot of renderings for them as well. And these are some of them. Also to visualize how the product is going to actually look like in the design point of view. After this, we actually went out into creating the prototype, a mock-up prototype over the chassis that you saw earlier, that we flew. So we started creating uh, the, the real, uh, realizing the, it in 3D and actual physical form of the product. So we started making it out of foam. We created blocks and make, made sections of different uh, at different lengths and created profiles and started cutting them. So this is a kind of foam model that we first created. It took around a month to create this foam model by three of us designers. Uh, after the foam model, we laid, we wanted to make FRP model. Uh, but because of shortage of time, we actually wanted to make a hollow model, but uh, we said, okay, we had some exhibitions coming up and we wanted to show this prototype there to demonstrate the whole product. So we made a solid prototype wherein uh, the foam is still inside and we laid it up with FRP, which is fiber and foot plastic. It gives a very tough hard, hardened surface to the, to the enclosure of the prototype that we made. So this is a layer process where FRP is laid up and it is laid up with putty to give it a smooth finish. You see the tail light there. It's a working tail light that we designed out of plastic moldings. We actually created a working working tail light there. So if you go down there, we did a lot of finishing activities where you create uh, the surface that you require. And it ended with the painting and the decals or the stickers that you see. So this is a enclosure. It was made in two halves. So it should fitting on the same chassis. Uh, after the thing was done, we actually fitted the ducts. Ducts were made by vacuum forming, which is a process where you actually create a pattern and then you uh, make a, you take a sheet of polymer and make it hot and you pull it with vacuum over the pattern. So it creates the shape of the pattern. 
so these ducts are vacuum formed and these are functional ducts with very light weight and uh, you see these kind of the finished prototype that was made in the end so again the chassis is flying you already saw the video so this prototype is made out of or it is over the same chassis the flying chassis so this can actually fly if it were hollow so the next task was to create a create a hollow air taxi now so we are trying to work on the same wherein we are creating a frp based or a carbon fiber chassis uh the frame that you see which can be made into a hollow frame so this is where the air taxi project uh was made in the end this is where it, it is right now at the status where you can see right now uh this was shown at various exhibitions and we we won a lot of awards in a few exhibitions there uh what happened after this coming back to the basic presentation of my design and the air taxi any questions till now for the air taxi thing yeah sarvesh i think there are a lot of questions that are coming out Okay, okay, but I think some of them you have answered as well. But uh, okay. uh, let me just uh, highlight a couple of them. All right. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, please go. Yeah. So, uh, an attendee by name Takalkar is asking in Dubai, Uber is also developing some kind of drone cabs. Uh, how can we compare that to Aerohans? Okay. so right now in the world there are at least 40 companies that we know of uh of which uber elevate amazon and ehang in china they are at the forefront there's also volocopter from europe uh they are working since the last 8 to 10 years in the field and they have developed some working prototypes or some working uh air taxi or drones flying flying drones comparison wise uh i would say this is indigenous is the first thing this is made made in india using indian technology right from motors except for batteries uh, we are designing our own motors our own propellers uh, is one thing but from a design point of view uh, what you see right now is just uh, our our goal of uh, creating an air taxi a lot of lot of details have to be worked on one thing you can say this is a more of a redundant air taxi and autonomous air taxi so we are building a lot of redundancy so i think there is no comparison or it might be similar in terms of function it will still carry passengers or payload of some some weight from place a to place b so it it all depends on the system in which it's going to work so how is the nearby surrounding system that is going to work so there for example there are a lot of automobile cars in the market each car is different so we are also one of the companies in india who are making air taxis we are yeah that is one of the things so there is no big difference i i mean every design will be different because different people make different designs and the kind of inputs that are given are different the results will be different right yeah okay. yeah so what it does is the same but it does in a different way yeah. in in our own indigenous uh, way right yes so uh, guruji patak and sanika are asking why the name erohans okay uh we 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 when we started designing or uh, working on the name what should be the name we came out with hundreds of names uh we said okay let us one of the reasons was that we wanted to have some indigenous indianness to it a lot of drones that you see in the market like dji is one of the very common drones that you have heard, must have heard there are a lot of security reasons and uh, security aspects of drones like we are not very comfortable with uh, the kind of data that they're going to capture like nowadays you see a lot of messages going on let's ban chinese products and let's ban like you you must have seen kunsuk mangdu and the video of that like so we said okay indian indian products is what we want to create at the same time we want to give a name which is uh known by the world as at the, at the same time it has to be something indian so hans is a bird that we all know and it's an indian name at the same time Aero is a word which everybody in the world would understand. It is something to do with flying thing, or a flying bird, flying Hans. So we try try to mix and match or merge these two together, 
so it also is a global name at the same time it is something local to our country nice so erovens came into it. okay so a tough question okay so uh, when you're comparing hans right a bird yeah. okay yeah. a bird flies through seamlessly i mean without causing any trouble correct so aruvidu is asking when a normal size drone flies above our head we feel air pressure and if yeah. such a huge drone flies above our head then it would be very huge air pressure rushing downwards correct so True. anything done on that yes so this is a part of the system design you are right uh, each of these propellers exerts a lot of air pressure or thrust underneath and that is what creates the lift also so there is a huge velocity air underneath so there is a system that is designed or that is being designed you can say so there will be a lot of aeroports drone ports around the city and uh, there will be these corridors so it's like a vertical tube so when the drone flies up it goes straight up uh, over the drone port and that's where nobody is standing underneath like you cannot stand under a aircraft engine when it is flying about to fly so okay. those kind of a security aspect it's a part of the system design uh, where you can say at the same time there there are a lot of uh, you can say compliances that are followed like the, i showed you in the earlier image where you saw the system design photo mm-hmm. there will be a lot of corridors air corridors which will be designed and the drones would be specified to fly in those corridors so right. a particular height would be given to the people or to these operators of drones where you have to fly at 200 feet 500 feet so it, these won't be flying like above our heads where we can feel those kind of vibrations or the air things so yeah it's a part of the system design where these things will be taken care of okay so at what height do you think these drones would be flying from the ground uh, level so these drones are capable of flying at say 3 feet onwards up to 1.5 kilometers okay oh okay that is a capability but at the same time the policy would guide us so the government mm-hmm. would say okay this is a height that you should fly it it should be above the any tree or building levels so right now the government has asked us to fly over 200 feet up to 500 feet that is a band given to us hmm yeah okay so a full scale aero hans would be like what dimensions a full scale aero hans would be typically of around 15 to 20 feet wide so it oh. is 10 times of what you see right now it's a sorry not 10 times uh, four times three to four times of this size that's like the depth of the car i mean the length yeah. of the car yeah it's like the, the aero so it's like a nano car the cabin is going to be like a nano size car two mm-hmm. or four passengers and then over that there'll be around 1 and 1/2 meters propellers on all four sides hmm so you can say it's around 5 meters 5 to 6 meters wide all right and at what speed would it be like uh, navigating so this particular drone that we saw the prototype flies at around uh, 60 to 80 kilometers per hour but the drones can the actual drones the full scale will fly at higher speeds are of 150 km per hour at least and since the distance is going to be air distance so the time take that will be it take to fly from a, a to b is going to be much shorter because there are no zigzag paths and routes mm. so you can fly straight from point a to point b so it's going to be very helpful right and uh, any expectation on the cost of travel like cost of travel is going to be like what we calculated per kilometer it is very early in right. the process so this is going to be operated by some operators for example you don't have to buy the air taxi like we we don't buy aircraft but we actually buy tickets and fly say by any airway company mm-hmm. so there will be companies who would operate this kind of uh, services and uh, you would pay not a huge amount so you can pay 1000 rupees and go from a place to your office Hmm. Like people who are very busy can could fly those. Like for example, some industrialist might want to attend quick meetings. Then they could, they also could afford it. Even people like us can afford them. Uh, there's a Sarvesh. There's a question uh, from Shivanand. Yeah. Sean here. It says, uh, when do you think the government will allow uh, air taxis? I mean, the meaning. Oh, yeah. what what's your progress with the government policies uh so we are working hand in hand with djca which is the director general of civil aviation authorities of the government who de- devise policies so as of today uh 
government is open to photography agriculture and some other small applications like inspection of by drones so they have not opened up a lot of things by drones so government is also learning and what we foresee is that government would first start with small applications small delivery things and they'll open up a policy by in the next year and once the confidence level is built and once a uh, larger drones fly without passengers because passenger safety is utmost and they would not easily open up to passengers so once we fly these kind of drones for other applications which are non passenger applications for two or three years only then that kind of confidence will be built and a lot of systems would be built around how they are going to fly what are the regulations uh, the air traffic control systems would be coming up in place for these kind of applications because these are autonomous and uh, things have to be set up and yeah we are at a very initial stage from a government point of view also so that is what we see around a four years of time then we look at for these to actually come in place for passenger at least but before that you'll see a lot of drones flying for other applications small applications so i guess uh, shilpa that would answer your question as well because shilpa was asking when are you planning on launching this so i guess the answer is for year 2324 2324 2324 okay um shilpa also has another question what about weather conditions like uh, she's yes. saying storms and uh, very like, bad weather yes so this drone uh, we have tried up to air speeds of say some values uh, it has been designed to sustain air speeds of certain uh, degree but like for any other aircraft uh, drones are much safer than other aircraft but yeah uh, it would not you it won't be allowed to fly in say cyclones or storms definitely because of some uh, aerodynamic issues but yes uh, we have a lot of redundancy built into the systems where it can take up a lot of loads it can a uh, fly state vertical horizontal so a lot of aerodynamics are easier in drones as compared to aircraft and helicopters so it's much safer in those kind of applications as well uh, can it can it sense a storm or can it sense weather conditions or basically that is an external is that an external uh, so object? there is always a, there is always going to be an atc like air traffic control okay yeah. which talks to the meteorology department there are a lot of lot of sensors in the drone itself which which actually measure the air speed but uh, we cannot predict that there is going to be a, a storm coming up that can be predicted by the meteor meteorology department and they can inform us but drone itself can measure the current status of the air around it but not a predictive thing that okay in 15 minutes there is going to be a storm those kind of application or those kind of sensing uh, we cannot do right now in the system so the atc would take care of it and that would indicate to the drone or inform the drone or advise of whether to fly or not to fly or to whether to come back home immediately or land at some nearby drone port okay yes interesting uh, there's another question by shivanand shetty uh, is have you tried any uh, tried approaching the indian army indian air force uh, yes. project yes yes i'll just show you some quickly uh, a small presentation that we gave for the defense forces and how these kind of applications would be suitable for uh, those kind of defense related uh, uses probably i'll just show you a quick uh, uh, quick uh, ideas that we gave for forces for defense forces sure uh, i just put it on zoom and i like that picture you found in iit delhi in the car of like or oh, your your picture <laughs> <laughs> i'm seeing that picture for a long time yeah <laughs> i think yeah, that's one of my favorite pictures of the product mm -hmm. okay you can see this uh, screen now cdrl for the forces i'm showing you some no we cannot see your screen as yet okay and probably so defense has a lot of applications where regulations are also not important so because dgca doesn't apply to defense so if if defense wants something uh, they want it so it is very easy or uh, 
you can say more useful for these kind of applications for defense why is it stopped okay. i think it has become very heavy and just closing some windows just give me a, a minute Yes, I think you can see it now. Yes, sir, Vish, we can see your screen. Yeah. So what we did is that the prototype that we had made, uh, you can see this arrow van. Uh, we say, okay, the same model that we saw earlier, if we can make it hollow and instead of a passenger, we can carry 40 kg of payload to it. So these are kind of arrow van models that we created for defense. And I'll show you some quick applications for defense. So we can use this for point to point. cargo delivery for defense applications or on demand uh, delivery for example on the enemy lines if some fights are going on and you need ammunition and somebody calls for ammunition the soldiers then this drone can quickly give the soldier ammunition so i'll just show you some uh, scenarios where this could be used by the army so these are large cargo the the that the, looks very huge the 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 thing that you saw uh where two people can sit around 200 kg it can carry so you can actually carry some large this is the scale that you, i i mentioned earlier 20 feet 15 20 feet huge so you can actually carry two to four people at, at the same time for cargo passengers it could be used on uh on marine applications or navy for carrying something this is a small delivery drone which you see flying earlier this is for uh on demand delivery of ammunition or some things by the uh, forces on the enemy lines or some kind of medical application for defense to carry some medicines or something on the field yeah so these are kind of applications that we had envisioned for defense that's very interesting yeah we we have also discussed with a lot of different guys and they are interested to work on these kind of solutions for them yeah yes. yeah very interesting so where we are right now on this air taxi like we started with the dream of air taxi but we figured out very soon that because of regulations uh, it is going to be a long term project you can see the screen right short term long term we can see the screen yeah so this is going to be a long term project where we can go on making air taxis for various applications for passengers for defense for cargo and things like that but at the same time to sustain ourselves and the company uh we cannot wait for four years and keep spending money to develop them so we said okay what is going to be mid term and short term so hmm. we we are looking at because also from a policy 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 perspective our del delivery drones would come earlier than passenger drones like i mentioned to build the confidence among people as well as the government authorities at the same time currently for short term there will be a lot of other applications for drone which we are working on which are autonomous systems so we are working right now on drone port systems where a drone flies and does a lot of small applications so this is the strategy that we are working on currently so apart from air taxi we are working on products like air the hardways which is autopilot so this is another product that we have developed right now which fits on any drone so any drone company can use this autopilot or any autonomous vehicle like a rover can use this autopilot to make it work autonomously and there is a software called aero gcs where you can plan things and make the vehicle move autonomously as per the path mentioned there uh what i mentioned earlier was about the drone port system so now we are doing what we are doing now is we are creating small drone ports which can be used for systems which which are for applications which are re repetitive in nature 
for example there's a company who wants to see how many vehicles are standing in the parking area like for a for a we are working with a client called mahindra for example and they have a production yard where they produce vehicles and thousands of vehicles are standing there to be going to the dealers for selling and they want to know which vehicle is parked where so they they use this kind of road systems and where we have a drone there the drone goes every morning or every 2 hours whatever you can schedule and it goes scans the whole yard and comes back to the drone port and starts charging again it gives the data okay this, which vehicle is standing where which which chassis is standing where so that kind of mapping can be done by that drone and it can give a ready made data to those companies so this kind of lot of there are thousands of industrial applications that these kind of drone port systems can do on a repetitive nature so we are working with police uh, also departments with delhi and mumbai police where they can use these kind of drone ports for repetitive applications so this is a drone that is going to we have already designed uh, it is a small drone which can carry around 1 and 1/2 1 and 1/2 kg of payload it is basically used to carry different kind of sensing cameras thermal cameras or any other cameras which can do a lot of inspection at applications uh it can also be used by fire uh, departments so as soon as a fire is there and somebody informs to a department there is a fire the drone can immediately fly from the fire department to the actual location where the fire has happened and it can stream live data of what is the status of the fire to the people who are sitting in the department and the, in the fire engines until the time they reach this drone can reach earlier and give the status so they can actually pre plan before reaching there okay what is the strategy so they can also reduce a lot of time uh, which is very critical in such applications at the same time the drone can also do a lot of things like it can uh, throw fireballs or it can do a lot of other actuation applications as well so we are also talking with these depart these kind of departments so that uh, smaller applications of these kind of smaller drones can be implemented uh i also show for this yeah so that is where the project is right now and on that the is front. very yeah. exciting there's so many possibilities for this yes uh, for this drone you know it's quite interesting so, so these are just a, a a tip of the iceberg applications yeah but there are tremendous applications in the industry right from energy oil and gas you just name anything and uh, there are a lot of applications that are there correct so if you get the technology right then it can be correct. used for multiple contexts true that's true. amazing very true yep yeah so um we have a question from a special guest okay. we have today abhishek bali from us yes. yeah tell me abhishek so uh, abhishek please go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question hey sir race how are you all good man you can tell me how are you great yeah great to hear your voice after so many years same here yeah so uh, yeah i have a question around uh, computational fluid dynamics uh, like okay. Okay. Uh, I I read your slide which says that you your team went for CFD, so I I just wanted to know more about it and uh, like from modeling uh, to engineering okay. uh, to CFD because you know what I know is now like I I manage the startup accelerator program um, the North America part of it okay uh, for the source systems and uh, we have some companies working around drones. and also in boston there's um, this accelerator called techstars which is working with us air force and i can actually later send you the links and sure. they are incubating startups this is the us air force sure. um so uh, i know that when there's a swaying payload there is a, a dynamic uh, loading condition which can affect the performance of the drone so i just wanted to know uh, like if you're using like a software of course uh, what software you're using and uh, what your team's experience was okay so regarding cfd so uh, let me again mention that we started this company in october 2018 and this prototype was ready by september 2019 so it it was only a year in which we very in a very fast manner created this prototype which could fly mm -hmm. and we what we did is we tried to understand we have not done very in depth analysis because it will take two or three more years to actually come with the real flying air taxi right. so what we did right now is what is essential for us to make this small prototype fly what we did is for the ducts so we did a lot of cfds based on okay ducted propellers and without non ducted systems uh, okay when we did ducted systems what are the advantages what kind of profiles of the duct 
uh, would actually help improve the thrust at the same time minimize the kind of weights and the manufacturing aspects of it so okay. most of the cfd was done around ducts and to uh, derive the profile of the duct which is okay. most suitable to improve the thrust of the propeller for this particular prototype only the small okay. thing that we did 40 kg is payload okay okay perfect and the software we used uh, used were so we had we hired a consultant because we couldn't keep a full time cfd guy so right. we have a consultant uh, who used some cfd software probably ansys on that i guess okay. ansys for C- for fda and cfd I, used, I don't remember what he used thank you okay okay perfect yeah so we should definitely talk uh, later uh, like offline and um, you know you uh, i can help you with a few things from my experience because uh, we have several programs at the source systems like for ketia uh, simulia which is high end simulation from abacus to all the you know cfd stuff structural simulation then of course solid works is also our product so we uh, we should definitely talk later definitely definitely abhishek thanks yep thank you yeah. so sarvesh i have yeah. one interesting question uh, from bargav yeah. yeah okay so um, he's asking are in there thousands of other designers who have same idea okay. how would your model compete with theirs okay so before i allow you to answer that okay yeah. i would yeah. like to highlight one small thing here okay yeah yes millions of people have billions of ideas just having an idea is not just enough right Correct. you got to go execute it out of those millions of designers who have ideas okay how many of them are actually doing like what you are doing you know so correct correct so i would i would want to highlight that that just having a dream or an idea is not enough but you got to take all that effort to execute it right yeah so you can answer the question now yeah yeah i mean most of it has been answered by you it okay. uh, thousands of ideas are there but how many of them are realized and also the other aspect of it is a designer alone cannot realize ideas of this kind of complexity right okay so you need a team uh i mean a, a person cannot be all rounder i mean there's a lot of engineering and technology going into it so a lot of aspects of that also uh, to you can make a prototype but how about the business viability so you also have to have the right business model to actually make it uh, see the day of the light of the day so you can create a prototype you can make it fly but how many of them would actually be seen as a business or in that scale would also be a question so you have to work with a lot of stakeholders and a lot of team effort goes into it to actually create a viable business or a product in the market right right yeah also to uh, sustain yourself so far uh, you know uh, without actual uh, product out there incoming coming in like you said uh, yeah. actually practically doing things and coming this far is a big thing you know uh, yes yeah. i guess that's what differentiates uh, So yes. People who go out and do something rather than uh, so many other designers out there who have an idea and just it remains an idea, you know. True, true. Also, for my investor, see, uh, to create this product to whatever we are right now, it also takes a lot of money and a lot of investment has to go inside to create this kind of a complex product. Uh, to attract investors, you need a different approach strategy. So, how fast can you also showcase your capabilities? and to create these kind of prototypes and demonstrate the capabilities that yes we can do it we have a team which is capable we have we have a in house team we also have a consulting team around us which help who also help us to create it so all that also matters and you have to fulfill the needs of each of each one of them and that what that is what also a designer has to do not only for users but also a lot of other stakeholders so and, and in the end come out with a very uh, robust strong product yes, yes, yes. definitely yeah and okay. that is where, that is also where we also pivoted to not only these air taxis but also small drones and applications that is for like drone ports because right. we have to sustain ourselves till the four years where air taxis going to come in so that also will help us to get more revenue to push into the air taxi project true true yeah so sarvesh um from a aspiring designer point of view so yeah. some of my students are asking here like for example abar anadi is asking okay um 
roughly how much time did you take to come up with one design so you have shown so many concepts so many ideas and etc right so what is yeah. the timeline like for generating one design so there is no end to design as such i mean you can't say a design is complete what you see is an intermediate design i mean that is that might not be what you see in that you and that is not a design you that you might see actually in the air after 2 years 3 years so design is uh, <laughs> Uh, never complete, but uh, it is always based on the timeline. So whatever timeline we decide in the end, okay, that this is we have to deliver something by September end, for example. Then whatever is ready by September end is the design, and whatever best we can do. So we had a timeline of a year where we had to fly this. So within that year, we did a lot of iterations. Uh, we decided on some iterations, some some concepts. Then we again detail out concepts within that concept. What else can it be? so we did a lot of iterations on those uh, detailings and all and it took around 3 months for us we actually started working on a design in february march april may yeah 3 months we finalized the design and 3 months it took to actually make the prototype ready so to be specific it took 3 months for us to finalize the design because that is what that was what our target time then was but if somebody says tomorrow okay let us come out with a design in a month we could do it in a month as well right yeah that's a lot of effort that goes in and as you said design never ends i mean yeah uh, these are only uh, intermediate stages correct no correct. there's so so much of refinement so much of innovation that can go into yes. refining the product yeah and even yeah. after design the product is launched in the market there's a lot of customer feedback that comes in after later right. on and that also drives a lot of design decisions in the end absolutely Uh, Sarvesh, I think you already got a potential customer here. There's a person oh. called Shilpa who is okay. asking you: Is it possible to purchase one of the A taxis from your company for themselves? Yes. Wait. If you have a lot of money, definitely. You pay us, we'll sell it to you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you, Shilpa. We'll meet you to understand your requirements, and we'll fulfill those. So Shilpa, you can possibly pass on your requirements, and we can make a customized taxi for you with a custom interior. Yeah, but I, but I, if I could add to that, um, I think um, uh, at some point of time in the future, it, I mean, these personal mobility vehicles may uh, reach that stage where people will probably buy them for themselves and you know travel that way, like what we used to see in the cartoons, you know, yeah. at some point yeah. of time. Yeah. So it'll tend to that, but at this point of time, I don't think uh, the permissions are 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 given for uh, personal usage yes. at this stage. Right. TGCA approvals would be required for that. Yes, Should, yes. Yeah. It's going to take a long long time for personal users, definitely. And also, other aspect to it is, you won't be allowed to fly it with on your own. Like you drive cars, you can drive like a crazy, but these would be mostly autonomous systems. where the vehicle decides using some some kind of intelligence so you don't depend on the human uh, human override would be there but at the same time human errors or uh, erratic driving patterns would be avoided mostly that is what we foresee actually an autonomous uh, driving system would be safer. possibly safer yeah. yes yes exactly assuming uh, all the bugs there are no bugs in the system yes sir, definitely true so shilpa i guess to answer your question even if you do want to purchase at this point of time possibly regulation is not going to um, uh, allow you to kind of uh, like use it you yeah. know okay do you have any more questions amish yeah sarvesh uh Uh, yeah. Can you show some of your other projects? Yes, your yes. personal projects. True, true. So right. what I'll do is I'll uh, move ahead. So this is where we are right now, air taxi. But yeah. I still have a lot of ideas. Like I cannot stop at air taxi. So I am still thinking of okay, what else can I do now? Uh, so I am thinking of new startups at the same time because my hunger for doing something new always is there. So I am looking at different aspects like grassroots healthcare. What can I do? Environmental things. I want to uh, go to the basics. Where I am, I can do farming or something like that. So I'm looking at different models where I can uh, go out of this technology thing and actually go to the basics, go to some Himalayas like Dehradun where Manas is sitting, and do some innovation there. So 
So let's see. Uh, what I have learned through my experience uh, from my childhood till what I'm doing right now, I li like to share some of those key learnings. Uh, one thing that I, I believe that I have become is a jack of all trades and master of one, which is design. And it is important for designers to be a jack of all trades. That's what I believe. Because the design field, uh, you can actually uh, do a lot of, you're, you're not bound to a particular domain. I mean, tomorrow you can design air taxis, you can design medical devices, you can design some educational courses, you can design some software, or you can design something else, or just a cup, mug for coffee. So a designer can, uh, has the ability to solve problems, and each design problem is a problem to, to be solved from different aspects. So the more you uh, gain knowledge and experiences from different fields, you become a better designer because you learn uh, a lot from different uh, aspects or different domains. A knowledge from a particular domain could be applied into a solution for your problem. That's what I believe and that's what I have become throughout these years, which I call Jack of all trades and master of one. A lot of people believe that Jack of, this is a bad thing to have to do. Like, why should you be a Jack of all trades? But I believe designers should be that. Like I do a lot of explorations. I, I'm into art music. I play a lot of instruments. Uh, I am into gardening and so I spend 40% of my time into my hobbies and 60% in my work. So in, even today I do a lot of composting, gardening. I grow my own vegetables at home. That gives me a lot of other uh, satisfaction or learnings from them. I keep learning okay, how, why something is not growing. So what are the things I give to it? So kind of uh, sensitivity to uh, different aspects and problem solving aspects you can learn through them. I yeah. have a lot of interest like restoration, teaching, I solve a lot of jigsaw puzzles at my home. I do a lot of uh, heritage walks. I like conservation of old buildings and antiques. I also collect a lot of antiques, stamps, coins, automobiles. And I, I do a lot of restoration work on them. I restore vehicles, I restore clocks, gramophones, cameras. I just give you a glimpse of what I do. So I believe that what I have learned is that you should always have a lot of hobbies, at least one hobby. Each one of us should have one hobby. And maybe in future that might turn into business. Like I might look at tomorrow restoration service, like you might see on history channels. Uh, but yeah, hobbies can turn into businesses definitely. Here, what I believe is that I had a dream of making a taxi when I was in college, and that is what is coming to life right now. At the same time, so yeah, you can do a lot of traveling and explorations. You meet people. You you have an open eye of observations. So you always should have your input sensors on and you should try to assimilate as much as you can from the surroundings in society. That's what I believe. And I do a lot of collection and restoration of these kind of vehicles, gramophones, clocks, radios, stamps. Uh, these are the kind of projects that I have in my hand right now. I have around 20 vehicles right now and uh, in different stages of restoration. Uh, that The blue thing that you see, the Maruti 800 1984 model, that is my first car that I bought 20 years back around 15 years back, I guess, 2004. Uh, there's this Morris Minor that I'm restoring right now. There's this 1954 standard 10 on the left down there. It is in a very bad state. And the, on the right side, you see 1955 Fiat cars, the black one and the blue one. So these are the projects that I am working on right now. And I want to make them working. So that also helps me to release or relax uh, and have some ideas because that's what I like to do. Uh, some two wheeler projects that I have in my hand. I have, I restored this Rajdoot on the left, you see. And this is what it became. It took around three or four months to make it into running Rajdoot. Then there are some scooters and motorcycles that are in progress. Uh, puzzles, traveling and all keep happening. Uh, some clocks restoration that I did. This is a 1862 clock that you see in the center. It's a, it was made in the Black Forest, Germany. It's called Lenskirch. It's a German clock. Uh, it was there with, with a guy called Mr. Khanna in Nasik. And the interesting fact is that it was not working with him. And somebody, uh, I mean, the guy went to a lot of clock makers and to, to restore it or re repair it, but none of them could repair it and make it work. So somebody, one of my friends met him and said, okay, there's a guy called Sarvesh, he could do it. So the clock came to me. And I said, okay, I'll repair it, but I'm, it's, it's my hobby. And I don't know how much I'll take, but I'll definitely do it. 
it took around 6 months and uh, i mean because i have some other work to do also but i could repair the clock which none, none of them could do and it has a very typical issue of uh, the shaft being very thin uh, the pivot was broken so you had you had you had to make a very tiny hole and make a pin uh, hole and create a new pivot which could be strong enough to hold the forces of the spring so yeah these kind of restorations i keep doing radios and clocks and old stoves and many more are there in the pipeline i just thought i will show some glimpses of those projects some furniture that i have old furniture that i keep restoring them on weekends yep so yeah have a lot of hobby hobbies and that would help you to become more hands on you can learn skills you can uh, understand what your designers or engineers would talk about and you can be a better or you can guide them in a better way probably uh also be curious and open to explore i feel that you should visit places whenever you have time you go out you don't have to go anywhere exotic places you might go to a railway station or a bus stand or anywhere else just go anywhere but go to new places and you can see a lot of people you can talk to people you can take small risks as well but yeah you can you can get a lot of information knowledge and different perspectives from different people you can i mean I, what i did is uh when i left my job one year i should do daily up and down from mumbai to nashik and i met a lot of people uh, in the train every day whom i would have never met otherwise because you generally meet people around your own domains like if you are a designer you'll, you'll you'll meet a lot of designer and related people you would never meet a guy who is carrying courier from mumbai to nashik for example because you would never come across those kind of guys because your domain of work so it's always good to go out uh, meet such people you get different perspectives and that that helps you improve your own uh design thinking or mindset i can say and observe and learn from them uh always keep an open eye observe things no matter how silly you can ask silly questions because that might make you unlearn a lot of things that you assume so yeah that's what i believe always carry some notebooks you you observe anything you just note it down it might be ideas it might be observations it might be problems so i carry a book so i don't have any dearth of problems with me for any new start startups for example so i have a lot of books that i filled through my observations and whenever i feel okay i need to do something on on some area i can go back to those notebooks uh, look at the observations look at the ideas that i had or look at the problem areas that i had noted down some time back that that those help me to today to decide on some of the opportunities so that is a good habit you could you could develop probably and you can challenge things why things happen you can ask questions why how things work or why things work in a particular way why not some other way that would also help you to innovate and solve problems in a different way so you can you can look at problems as, as opportunities and not the problem yes and you can i'm just not being very gyan giving you gyan here but that's what i learned and you can lead organize participate lot of events where you could build your team works team working skill because a lot of projects like air taxi would require a lot of team work to be done you cannot be an independent designer an independent designer you can design small products which are simple designs but to build complex systems you would have to work in teams and you would have to learn to give and take and understand talk in the same language as the other people talk and yeah so that kind of skills are there and you have to make make best use of available resources that you have you don't have to wait for things like whatever you have you could create something out of those things that you have and you believe you you be have you have to be patient believe be adaptable to changes like when we when we realize that data taxi is a long term thing we quickly try to adapt ourselves to some other solutions like okay smaller drones for some small applications for police or fire brigades or some inspection applications we quickly try to pivot ourselves or change ourselves or adapt ourselves to the situations that would actually make it work so yeah once you do that you could uh, pass through it and be successful and at the end then you should always give back to the society to the environment you should be conscious about uh, something that you would give it back you should not be always you might not always be selfish and getting something out for yourself but yeah you should be looking at the environment and society as well so that's what i had for today as learnings that i had which i could share with you as well and i am open to more questions from this yeah that's a very fantastic uh, sarvesh 
uh, quite happy to see so many cars and uh, bikes okay. uh, waiting for your restoration work. Okay, you know, that's uh, pretty cool. Okay, and uh, any specific? I mean, you have given a lot of uh, advices and uh, uh, insights in terms of okay, what what uh, a person should be doing, right? Okay. So, like an yeah. aspirant or a design aspirant, okay, or a designer himself, okay, that's pretty cool. But if we have to pick one of the insights, okay, is very crucial for the design aspirants. Okay. Okay. What would that be? Only one insight. I think uh, the most important thing would be to observe and keep an open mind to learning. Hmm. Uh, because designers are never users. I mean, sometimes they are, but uh, you never, you might not always uh, design for yourself. And to design for somebody else, it it is important and very imperative to understand the perspective of that person, or that particular domain, that field, and and hence it is important that the designer uh, be an open mind, and observant, with an open mind to look at things from the others' point of view, or to step in the shoes of others, to have empathy of the other guy. So yeah, observations and detailing to observations is very critical to designers. Right. So, because if you understand the problem well, you can find a solution. If the problem is not understood properly, or the insight is not clear, no matter what solution you design, it's it'll it, it has high chances of failure. Yeah, because it's a superficial uh, solution. True. Yeah. So Sanika is asking, what do you mean by giving back to environment or society? As designers, how can we give back to the environment or society? There are various ways in which you can give back. One is at least being conscious of what you're doing. So, for example, being conscious that you are responsible for the environment. For example, so when I, when we are doing any taxi, we are making sure that in spite of being a very high tech project, project, high technology project, how we can still be environment conscious. What are the kind of materials that we're going to use? How are they going to be? Uh, what is the what is going to happen to the taxi after it's used? Are we using recyclable materials or? So how can we be reducing the carbon footprint that the whole system is going to look at? So how can we compare the, the drone system with the current vehicle systems? So those kind of things, we, the aspects that we, we can get into uh, where we can be responsible towards the environment. At the same time, society, uh, so you might also look at designing products for the environment or designing products for the society. That is what I mean by giving back. So being conscious, not only about the the high end needs or the needs of the elite but also uh for the sustainability of everybody in the society and the environment that's what i meant to say okay we, yeah. we have an interesting question from vaidehi shirsat she's saying uh her question is about humanity students right what advice would you give Humanity students thinking about pursuing product design. Um, okay, I think humanities. Uh, what I understand is about. Uh, uh, I think uh, when I started my career, it was into user experience design, and it was more into research. So, wherein we had to go to the field, uh, we had a lot of you. Uh, type of people and we had to understand insights. Like for example, Nokia phones were very new then in 2004. So what kind of people, what kind of uh, mindsets or the mind mo mental models do people have? So understanding and doing design research, we, we needed a lot of humanities people. So humanities people, I think uh, the guys from humanities domain are good in terms of uh, understanding the society, societal need. They, they might be uh, stronger in those aspects. Like, like designers, Anybody can be a designer. Engineers can be designers. Architects can be designers. Humanities or art field. Each of these can be designers, but each of them bring a di different strength to the field of design. So from that perspective, I, I believe humanities are would would uh, bring the approach of user-centered design with a strong point in that. They could be more uh, user-centered or they could be more closer to the users going to the field, getting information data, understanding, getting insights. So those could be the strong points where user, humanity students would benefit from them. 
Yes, she also talks about the circular economy concept, uh, but I guess you've already answered the question before about being more environmentally conscious and, you know, uh, when you in incorporate that in your design itself, uh, and uh, you already spoke about that. Anyway. Okay, so there's an uh, interesting question here from Shilpa and somebody else, I think, Bargav. Yes, Bargav. Uh, basically, uh, between a helicopter taxi and a drone taxi, okay, like uh, what's the similarities or differences? Meaning like uh, Bhargav is asking, will a helicopter taxi outdo a drone taxi? Okay, I'll answer that. Uh, there are a lot of advantages of a drone taxi as compared to a helicopter taxi. Helicopter taxi works on complex aerodynamics, a helicopter basically. It works on a single propeller and uh, it is, it is, the drone is much safer than a helicopter, I would say, because a lot of redundancy is built into the drones. As I mentioned earlier, it could be a hexopter or octocopter, where there are n number of propellers systems built. So even if a particular or two or three different propellers don't work or motors don't work, or they break or some accident happens, the drone can still fly and take you down safely. That is how it is built. While as a helicopter is uh, you might have heard a lot of ha accidents happening with helicopters. That is inherent because the helicopter, it is dependent only on a single uh, engine and a single propeller system. So that is also the aerodynamics of helicopters are very different. Uh, that is one of the differences in terms of safety. Other aspect is the redundancy in terms of electronics. Since it's an electrical system, electronic system, a drone is much... Uh, it's much possible. It's more possible to make it autonomous. So a drone is an autonomous system, wherein safety can be built. While as in a helicopter, since it is manually flown most of the times, and it needs manual intervention always, uh, it is again not so safe because humans equal is equal to errors. Uh, majority of the accidents that have happened in the aircraft industry are because of human errors. So that is where autonomous drones would definitely play a big role, and that is the difference that would be there in a drone taxi as well as helicopter taxi. At the same time, the cost or the pricing of a drone taxi would be lesser than a helicopter. That's what we have figured out. So it is more feasible or viable option. Does it answer? Yes, yes, very interesting, yeah. Uh, okay. uh, I think uh, a lot of uh, attendees and even myself and I, I hope others are also seeing in you a probable Elon Musk. Okay. Right. So are you uh, are you wanting to be one of him or? Like, uh, I don't know. I mean, you don't want to be anybody. We want to be what we are. <laughs> Let's see what comes up. I mean, we don't have those kind of. At least I don't have those kind of dreams to become somebody. But let's see what I become. Right. That's yeah, yeah. Amazing. Okay, Ramesh, I think you have... I, 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 like I, I would like to be discreet and going back and becoming unknown. That's what I would say like. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty cool. Okay. So, uh, one last question by Sanika. Okay, can drones be uh, can drones be flown only linearly? Uh, drones can do a lot of things. Uh, if you just type on YouTube, drone races. Okay, mm. drone racing you can type. Drones are highly flexible, unlike helicopters. Uh, it will also link to the previous question. Drones can go straight up, straight down. They can flip and still be stable. Uh, they can do a lot of all kind of acrobatics, you can see. Mm. Like you see in those air shows. So drones are very maneuverable and uh, they can take any kind of paths. Right. Okay. Cool. So I think uh, we have uh, asked all the questions what attendees had. Okay, and uh, I think we can we have reached the end of the session. Okay, and it was uh, fantastic catching up with you, Sarvesh, and seeing all your work. Okay, and uh, in fact, Sarvesh uh, 
myself and Sean, we were all classmates together. And yeah. uh, Sarvesh and I used to go to Ghaziabad to work, yeah. uh, to do an internship with uh, Hero, Hero Global Studio. Living. Global Design. Hero Global Studio, right? Yeah. yeah. So we used to take those long bus journeys in hot sun in the morning and come back in the evening, late evening, right? Like yeah, yeah. almost sometimes it used to be like two at night. True. They used to drop us back in a taxi. Yeah. Right? So uh, we had shared a lot of uh, time, memories, and very nice to see that you have gone through different design domains and uh, now you, you are working on a dream project of yours. It is very nice to see. and. We were always amazed by the kind of work Sarvesh used to do. You know, so whenever we were given some kind of an assignments, we used to think in one direction and Sarvesh used to surprise us with some other mechanically working stuff. You know, I was uh, giving the example of uh, one assignment where we have to, uh, we have to do something with a CD case, like CD cover, all right, the plastic cover that you get for the uh, thing, right? And we were given that assignment and everybody does uh, does do something on that. But Sarvesh has uh, created a small working uh, engine. He has fit in a two-dimensional kind of like a thin engine in a CD case. And he has presented that work and it has really blown us away. You know, all the students. And it was a great time. And in fact, whatever he used to do, he used to do everything hands-on. You know, uh, something that works and... Uh, uh, that was uh, pretty cool. Okay, so uh, thank you, Sarvesh, again for coming over and showcasing your journey, showcasing your projects, and giving us those valuable advices. Uh, we wish you great luck going forward, and we wish to see Aero Hans fly over the sky in 2023 or 24. And uh, I hope, uh, I really hope that scenario will come, and we all will be traveling in those and. Uh, having better journey experiences and reduce the uh, time travel from point A to point B. Okay? Yes. So thank you so Definitely. much. And uh, thank Sean, you. would you like to add something? Yeah, I just wanted to add here that uh, just, just for everybody's information, I mean, Sarvesh is uh, also a brilliant musician. Uh, I've, I've, here, I've heard him playing. I mean, he's just amazing on the violin and he's just a brilliant. Uh, uh, and, if I have to say it very frankly, I think he's one of the most talented people I've ever met. Like, he is just unbelievable. If some of y'all do get a chance to meet him in uh, uh, Maharashtra or you know, wherever he is, you know, Nasik, you can just try and meet him. He's just an amazing person to meet. And, and uh, we've had a great time. Yeah, we're all classmates. And I think we had a brilliant time. We used to travel a lot to the Himalayas. I do not know if you remember. Exactly. Uh, uh, Uttaranchal, Himachal, uh, uh, Jammu, Kashmir. We have had uh, great uh, sure. travel times together. Anyway, all the best. Brilliant, um, brilliant talk. Very inspiring. Um, superb ideas. It's amazing to see the work you're doing. And like, like Umesh said, we're all just uh, waiting and hoping that you know your product really comes out uh, soon. And I'm sure it will really benefit all of us. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks, thanks, Sean and Umesh. Thanks for getting me here. It was really good to get back to you guys again. Mm -hmm. And all the memories that you shared about traveling and the projects and the Hero Global Design thing that we used to go together with Umesh. Yeah. I mean, it's getting, it's, it's very good to get back to those kind yeah. of things. And thank you for, uh, thanks everyone and wish, you, wish everybody all the best in their careers in the future. And if any time, any kind of help, or support required from my side. I'm always there through Sean and Umesh and DQ Labs. We could de definitely get back in touch with you guys. And yeah, see you again. Wish you all the best. Thanks again. Yeah. yeah. Just before we close, I, I have seen one interesting question. All right. I would want to answer that. And it's very, very important that everybody understands this. Okay. So yeah. uh, Sanika is asking how you faced failures in the process. Can you? Can you just tell about your failures and how did you handle those? Uh, failures, there were multiple. Like without failures, nothing. I mean, everything ex expected will. So the approach that we do is uh, fail fast, is what we try to do. Mm. So we find out all the reasons why it would fail and make it fail with that reason. 
so it's always good to find out why thing would fail and let it fail fast we don't have to wait for it to fail when it actually goes to the market so a lot of testings and so physically or by design a lot of testings have to happen not not only after making it but maybe even when you have a concept you can always go back to the users and get them tested on the paper okay this is what i'm thinking what do you think about it will it work will it not work so those kind of testings at a very simple level at the same time physical testings when you actually make it work so those are kind of failures in terms of the design and product but from a failure point of view of the business or the ideas those have also come up a lot like one of the things was you can call it a failure or not a failure but for example when he said okay we want to make an air taxi and we dreamt of making an air taxi and after a year when we actually started working with the authorities we realized that okay we cannot sustain on air taxi and we already spent crores of rupees already in a year and how can we wait for four more years and spend more amount of money so what do we do so we have to quickly adapt ourselves and look at the backup plans and what we can do after we fail so one thing is that we have to predict some failures other thing is we have to be ready uh if it fails or something fails with some other plans that is the overall strategy we used and that's why we pivoted to some other options at the same time yeah so failures are part of the process yeah. and we have to accept and we have to get back to our work as quickly as possible not just get discouraged because of the failure and we need to understand that everything fails yes and as you said fail fast so that we can reach faster yeah right amazing yeah. amazing <laughs> so amazing sarvesh thank you so much for being with us and uh, uh, we have been getting great appreciation of your work okay on the chat and uh, i hope everybody who attended this session has uh, leaving this session with a lot of enthusiasm and energy to do some great work like sarvesh has done all right so um, i i would like to thank all the attendees and the students who have utilized this uh, session today and uh, let's meet next sunday with a with a amazing speaker please subscribe to the youtube channel so that you get to know the uh, the information about the upcoming live webinars all right thank you all and thank you sarvesh for your time thanks thanks everybody thank, thank you so much sarvesh bye 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 bye